Welcome to our ComposeCast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I am doing well. Uh, I am actually really excited now to start to look into Ethernet over coax. It's kind of a weird thing we were just talking about. I have like a cable drop to my room but I don't have Ethernet. And you've mentioned many of times, hey, you should get Ethernet running to your room. Up until now, I didn't real, you know, I was thinking I would have to run another 60-foot cable where the existing coax is. But now that you've brought this kind of idea to my mind, I'm just thinking of all the possibilities. So I'm doing well over here. I hope you're doing all right. I hope everything's pretty good over there. Uh, how are you doing today? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm excited to to help you along and 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 get you some good Ethernet up there. So if if Jack's uh, video or, or audio freezes, uh, we uh, we can blame him for that because he hasn't set this up yet. But it's not like you're running a data center in your house that would catch on fire, is no, it? Jack? No, 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 no. I'm not. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Europe's AWS is Europe instance <laughs> catching on fire, uh, heating up. It. Uh, We'll just jump right into the intro here. It it was the first news item I saw, kind of a big one. Another one, Europe. What's going on with your data centers over there? What, what it must be bad weather or something. Um, but I think this was this is AWS's EU one data center that they have. I'm pulling up the article right now. Their EU central region. So I think it's in Frankfurt, Germany. If I'm not mistaken here. Um, and essentially what it looked like, okay, you started off with a fire. I don't think there was an actual fire. I just think a UPS kind of blew and there wasn't a fire, but they had to send in, they have this gas that eliminates all the oxygen. So instead of sending out an entire, you know, setting off in a sprinkler system, just ruining everything, it emits this gas and the gas just kind of shuts down, you know any kind of oxygen just stops everything but everyone had to evacuate from the building they had to have the fire department come and clear that there was no fire and then they had to wait a couple hours for this you know this toxic gas who would have thought humans need oxygen they had to wait for this toxic ga- gas to you know escape before anyone was cleared to go back in so i <laughs> i guess we're i guess i'm lucky i don't live in a data center um but I think it just goes back to, you know, what's a cloud service and it's essentially someone else is just hosting it. And so you get into this, who who takes responsibility for what at what times? And, you know, that kind of just fell on AWS right there. Now I'm sure it's in their contracts for, hey, you can't, we have this number of uptime, but you have to be smart enough to architect your systems to be within multiple availability zones. So, you know. Always news when something catches on fire. This can't be counted out. Absolutely. So, not a fire, but certainly not something good uh, in in the cloud. Uh, and obviously, this is going to be high profile because it's it's AWS, um, and they are probably the world's largest cloud provider. Now, I know. Linode, I think, is actually the oldest by by about three years, but yeah, they're they've been around. Have you ever been on low end talk at all, Jack? I have not. Uh... I've got on to get a couple couple of recommendations recently. I was looking for a server uh, down South America um, and and some uh, in like the Australian region, and turns out that like Linode and DigitalOcean and and really even AWS don't have a lot of presence, at, at least specifically that I saw down in South America. So I was looking on uh, low end talk was able to to point me in the right place for a couple of providers there, but that was just that was interesting to me. I mean, I living up here, you know, in north north central Ohio, I guess, you know, there's data centers all over. I can um, so all the providers up here that I'm used to, I got a think outside the box when when i'm looking outside the country so that was that was interesting to me uh but aws does have plenty of of uh, data centers in europe now i don't know what difference they have over there that they do over here but uh 
let's hope they start getting their act together. Yeah. Well, this that's that's a little bit that's a little bit of a cheap shot, but you know it is it is interesting. It, it it's always good to keep ourselves reminded that this is simply someone else's computer, and we need to architect for failure. Right. So simple point. Um, made by a simple story. Right. And then the other point is just because they're AWS or just because they're whoever doesn't mean they're infallible. And I think that kind of leads right into the next one here, which is Fastly CDN service that actually supports a lot of the web, you know, just providing that, uh, what, what, what do you want to call it? Edge, edge CDN, just basically, um, uh, making sure assets are closer to you. So you don't have to wait 30 seconds for a, a page load. Um, they had issues this past, I think it was a week ago now, about a week ago, where one of their customers put in a configuration change and it took down Fastly's services. Now, this is, I didn't see the full or, or the actual like technical uh, post-mortem on it but it sounded a lot like someone just hit restart cache and that's kind of what they provide so you know it went from a warm cat you know people talk a lot about warm cache it just basically wiped every wiped, wiped that entire cache out and then just you know instead of you know going from a warm cache where it takes you know five minutes to kind of reload everything in because it's already loaded it's hey in 45 minutes we'll have everything up and running again you know we restarted our service we we kind of just restarted everything it looks like so unfor- again unfortunate to see but i think it i you know i think with this with cdn i, I think it's a great jumping off point for kind of what we're doing here at our compose and speeding up next cloud i i know you had worked on some stuff this past week in terms of you know getting assets closer to the users yeah, and and I'll touch on that really quickly here. Under the development side, I have a link to the pull request here. Uh, basically, I was I was looking on Nextcloud site as to yeah you know, how, how how do we optimize this? I mean, there's there's got to be a way. Now, right now we are running the Apache instance instead of the PHP FPM instance, so we are hopping through a second Proxy. web server yeah. in 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 order to hit that. That's not something I'm too concerned about right now. Down the road, I think we can optimize for that. And and I would want to, too, because there are other containers out there that do that same thing, especially for PHP. So if I were to be able to figure that out, how to put that behind reverse proxy, that would be nice. Uh, unfortunately, um, a while back, whenever I was setting that up, I, I could never get it quite working the way I wanted it to. So I wasn't... And, and it could be some of the way that we, we architect our infrastructure and, and networking and stuff like that. So if, if that's the case, you know, we may not be able to get that. But for the for the time being, this is this is fine. Uh, but we do have the capability of putting stuff directly accessible to the front end proxy, which is going to be all the static files and, and stuff that would be served in a manner s- similar to the way a CDN would serve static files. So what I ended up doing was putting all the uh, application code and everything that's delivered to the browser when a page gets hit, all that is now being delivered straight through the proxy instead of through the double jump. So I didn't, I didn't get any good metrics, but anecdotally, uh, there is a, a uh, increase in the speed that the page loads. So that's, that's always good to see. Um, and uh, also I've been playing around <laughs> with some of the NVMe instances. And that has helped a lot, especially since we keep a lot on disk as well. We, we do utilize swap uh, to compensate for the low end of the, the server spectrum and when, when it comes to RAM. So having that on a fast disk is going to be, you know, make, make, it, make a pretty big difference. Uh, so those kind of improvements, you know, you start working towards a really quick responsive system so i'm i'm really happy to see some of that stuff come along um and and having fastly in there was just a a really great analogy you know having just implemented that and say look you know this is this is where you'd store things if if you were a cdn you know and if if the the great thing about our compose i think 
is that really at the core of it, a lot of this can be broken up into parts. Like with with a little, little bit of retooling, right? You can you can break this up and, and scale this pretty nigh infinitely. Because I mean, you're you're running a front end, you're running a, a BL layer, and you're running a database back end, right? It's it's not that complicated, and a lot of the stuff stuff does scale horizontally. Uh, so I was I was really happy to to put that together like that so that we really don't have a ceiling to how far we can grow. Um, so at this point, it's just implementing some of the cool features. And, and this is one of them. Absolutely. Uh, now, one of the interesting thing was, and I did want to touch on this too. So I initially went in and, and the way I do this is I, I, I do a little bit of uh, bind mounting. Uh, but if you look at the actual commit, it is linking to a, a location on the Docker container that is actually outside of the actual uh, application itself. Uh, because what we do is we link to the layer where those files were initially transferred in. But what Nextcloud does is it transfers it in the user source or user local source, something like that, Nextcloud. And then it rsyncs it over into the web server directory in the entry point script. Gotcha. Yeah. So there was no bottom layer where those files existed because it was only copying over during the entry point script. So what I had to do is I had to go back and I had to figure out where is that rsyncing from and then go grab that source and bind mount those files rather than where the the resulting files were so that was that was very interesting to me i had to i had to really dig di dig deep into the, like the docker file and the entry point script and say all right what are these guys doing here what are these cute little hacks and how can i make my cute little hack work with their cute little hacks so that was fun i i did enjoy doing that uh and speaking of that uh, i do have n a next cloud bullet point in here and i'm going to change this in the show notes because i meant to say canboard this is this is not a next cloud update it's actually a canboard update uh, so canboard eight days ago got updated to 1.2.20 uh, so i didn't see anything crazy here just a couple of bug fixes and various things that implemented uh closing out a couple issues here and there one thing I'm really impressed with this project is that they've really seemed to struck a st stride with their issues to bug fixes. Like they, they keep their issues fairly low um, and, and they, they seem to keep on top of them and, and they're able to address them in a, in a timely manner. Uh, and I, I came across in an opinion piece recently uh, about the best way to start contributing to open source. And I, I've heard this before, but this was explicitly calling out triage as a really good way of contributing because a lot of people are going to file a lot of issues, right? Especially the people who are more technically inclined. And what do you do with that? I mean, how do you how do you figure out what's real, what's not, what's important, what can wait a bit, uh, what's a feature, what's a you know bug, stuff like that. So so that kind of triage. Uh, they said is is really important. So anyone wanting to jump into to open source uh, contributions, right, and doesn't code, um, you know, that's a that's a really good thing to do. Jump in there and and start triaging. Uh, now another thing you can do is um, translate and and looking at the book sack release. Uh, there's there's a couple of features we'll go over, uh, but at the bottom, what I love here is you know he he calls out the translators. Right, so so these are people who are just going through and and uh, PHP is fairly good about templating all of their strings. I don't know if Booksack, for instance, includes this, but I would I would assume so. Uh, but what they do is they they can put whatever they can substitute whatever language, whatever locales specified, right? So you just throw that in. But all you all you need to do is, is go through all of the strings that are in there and say, all right, how would I say this phrase in uh, German? How would I say this in Italian? How would I say this in Portuguese? Right? So they've got they've got people translating Korean, Ukrainian, um, Chinese. So there's there's a lot there's a lot here. So that's always another good 
non-technical way to contribute to open source code uh, is to translate if you are bilingual. Pe people need that. And that was at the very end of, of Dan Brown's blog post. Uh, so, so thank you, Dan Brown, for calling those people out. You're really a bro. So uh, he does have a couple other things. Uh, this is, this, I, I love Bookstack. I really do. Right. So he's talking about his favorite system here that he implemented. He said, for quite a while, I've wanted to be able to favorite specific items within Bookstack for e easier featured location. Like I always go to our page where I talk about minimizing um, our audio and video, yeah. in, you know, into a WebM from an MP4 and lowering some of the quality settings and and getting it so that it's it's a lot smaller file size for us to actually save. I always go back there, but I mean, all I had right now is like a bookmark. So what he's talking about is like inside Bookstack. Uh, he said, for this release cycle, I decided to be a bit selfish and spend a couple of nights getting this implemented. Uh, and he talks about, you know, getting feedback from, from the GitHub issue uh, and just going out how you can favorite a page. Basically, it's exactly what you would expect. You have just a list of pages that you favorited. Um, uh, and, and a good one here also is a next and previous page and chapter navigation. I was like, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. If you're considering it to be oh, a book, you, would you want, want to be able to flip to the next page. Right. What's the next chapter? Go figure. Um, uh, also tags within search results, um, some LDAP stuff, um, and, and dark mode updates. It's always good to see. Of course. Uh, so that's all coming out in... Uh, 21.05 uh, so we will be updating to the latest well and and i don't know how we want to track bookstack because he's not doing semantic versioning he's doing monthly versioning or, or date version i don't know how you want to say that but uh, so like his releases are 2104 uh, and he just came out with 2105 my thought is that we'll probably just follow the second to last stable whatever that is so if stable here is 2105 we'll probably track uh, 2104 on our next migrations which are slotted for the end of this month any thoughts on on either of those i'm kind of excited to see this favorite system only because i'm kind of in the same boat as you i have a bookmark for actually it's it's similar it's for not for compressing the audio and mp4 files but for editing the podcast and what what steps I need to take post cut or post edit to, you know, master it and get the volume, cor volume corrected. So, um, I use that a lot. And then, oh, uh, there were a couple other pages in there that I find myself going to, to visit, um, whether it's, you know, a page I'm working on or whatever it is. Um, I know there are a couple out there that I use a lot. So it is a lot easier than navigating. I've been usually instead of hitting the bookmark, cause I got about a million bookmarks of things I want to read to, you know, this is going to be important one day. When's that one, you know, and this is in backlog of uh, to do of read, you know, it's like, uh, it'll be nice to have something internal to book stack where I can log in and, you know, click to it versus, navigating through either my own bookmarks or navigating through Bookstack itself through, you know, usually it's about four clicks. So I also have a to do to implement next episode on our Jekyll page for the, the Arc and Postcast because uh, we don't have that. And literally we're going back to the episode menu every time we want to change a episode. So that's, that's something. And yeah, kind of one of those things where like, Oh, I guess it wasn't there before, but this will make it that much easier. So just happy to see it. Uh, and, and speaking of podcast episodes, uh, WordPress put out their latest, and I was very interested in its content. Uh, it is actually episode 10, Finding the Good in Disagreement. I was uh, very shocked to see that having just talked about that in the last yeah. episode, right? We are talking about you can't win an argument. Right. And how to keep a disagreement from becoming an argument. So I, I thought that was very apropos of them. Uh, and and I, it, it just kind of touches on the general importance of soft skills in the industry. Right. I mean, we are in a tech industry. We're in a very you know hard skill kind of industry. 
but the soft skills really do shine through, right? The ability to prevent a disagreement from becoming an argument, right? To have a healthy disagreement, that is very important. And I do want to continue talking about that. So I'm, I, this is just kind of reinforcing my thought in that we are going in the right direction. We are talking about things that need to be talked about. So I'm very happy to see that kind of ecosystem start to, to incorporate that, you know, writ large. Uh, and, and I'm happy to, to do my part, to put my voice out there. Uh, that's all I had for the uh, community updates, though. You also had some developments in Portal, if you wanted to speak to those. Actually, yeah, I was a fairly substantial amount, so, so we can we can spend. I was kind of looking at last episode's show notes to see if we had discussed them. I didn't go back and listen to the episode, but I think we had mentioned them last episode that we were planning to implement them. Now. I'll say I can say this episode that they are they are implemented they have been implemented so I I touched on them last show but uh, I'll go I'll cover them here again because I think they are it was two kind of substantial uh, releases that we included I think one it was one point seven one which was the ability to modify the environment and then one point eight zero was the ability to look look at logs uh, the proxy logs for different services now. Right now, I'd say what we have for the Nginx logs, which is what I can dive into, is with those proxy logs and viewing them, right now we have a very, it's a very, I, I'll say it, it's a baseline. for It's a jumping off point. Right now, it's, there's limited navigation in what I would, is what I would call it. So I, I, w- I would like to be able to do, you know, counting the number of visits per day or visits per week or, you know, some kind of advanced analytics or even you know, being able to just scroll through all the logs versus right now, I think it shows the 200 most recent, um, you know, hits for now it does it per service. So you can check, you know, what's being rounded to the portal service. What's, you know, is something hitting my next cloud instance that I'm not aware of that I should be aware of. So again, jumping off point for both of these, but really, I think we're at a great point to continue to develop them. Those are the two major developments that we have been working on or currently working on. Nothing else to add for those two developments. Um, Excited for what's to come here in either later this quarter after some uh, command center stuff's completed or early next quarter for both of those. But we were chugging, I'd say we were really chugging along here. Yeah, we're, we're coming down to the wire for what we wanted to get implemented for Q2. Um, so obviously, like all goals that are set months in advance, we're probably not going to hit all of them. Uh, but I think we're going to have a substantial amount completed, I, I, I would hope. Absolutely. Um, including some command center stuff uh, by the end of this month and um, maybe even some nifty ansible container portal correcting running stuff so we'll see we'll see how that goes um i think we've architected in such a way to to make some of this stuff possible which is why i'm excited about that um but yeah i think i think we are ready to to keep on chugging away here and if that's it i will dive into I feel like we dive into stuff all the time. We are always diving into something. <laughs> we really are, man. Just head first, right? I'll tell you, I'm transitioning into my segment. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Sounds good. I, I have no segue, um, but I will ride into the sunset that is um, NextCloud User Management. And I say sunset because this is the last section, I believe, that we are going to touch on NextCloud. Uh, this should be this should wrap up all the documentation that I wanted to develop uh, through this. I mean, it there's it's, a lot. It's really great. Yeah. It kind of lines up, yeah, with with what we had going on this quarter. Uh, we we did a lot, um, and we can dive into the the next quarter with a couple more goals. Um, maybe reevaluate. I I think we're doing good. I I like this format. I mean, it's it's really working for us. It it gives us a clear picture of of what to do next and. And it seems to be just fine. So I'm, I'm going to keep going with this. Um, and that means that today we're going to touch on the last bit of NextCloud, which is user management. NextCloud has plenty of documentation on user management. And 
like any good sysadmin, I would point there before I point to my own documentation. So if I take a look at, at Nextcloud's documentation, the the link that I sent to is is more so the promo, right? So they, they go through what they have and what you can do with user management and, and kind of their pitch, right? So their their user management pitch is easy account management from five to fifty million users. Now I, I don't think I'm ever gonna be able to test that whole fifty million thesis, but hey, you know what? It's if there. it works. Uh, th now they do have a whole lot of integrations and stuff here that we will probably never use. Uh, we, we may in the future, but there is plenty to touch on here, uh, to start off with. I mean, the most basic aspect of any kind of user management, I mean, what, what are you going to do with users? So the, the first one is that, you know, anyone who's an admin, yeah, administrators can create, modify, search and view user accounts using Nextcloud built-in user management. Name, disk quota, mail addresses, and group membership can be handled and users can be given administrator privileges if needed. So I wanted to dive into those last two things a little bit. I wanted to go over what Nextcloud sees as their groups and administrator privileges. So their groups here, uh, they, they highlight thusly. They say you can assign new users to groups when you create them and create new groups when you create new users. So we'll unpack that in a second here. You may also use the add group button at the top left pane to create new groups. New group members will immediately have access to file shares that belong to their new groups. That's basically going to be the most important part of this here. Uh, to, to set the stage for what we start off with, there are two groups by default on our Compose installs, the admin group and the users group. By default, the initial user is placed into both of these. So what we have set up, and, and this is for our Compose installs that are done in compositional enterprises infrastructure. Now the script is out there in order to automate user creation and setup but we don't include that in the role. The initial user is only set up uh, in the, the only user uh, account is set up with our third party scripts, if you want to call them that, or our, our internally developed scripts. Uh, the, the actual role itself, that is simply going to set up the next cloud install um, and create kind of a bot administrator user. Um, I, I think it's just an, an admin user in order to, to log in if you know those credentials. It's something that gets automatically vaulted. So that's always going to be secure for you. So on the compositional enterprise R Compose installs, the admin group gets set up and, and that is actually a special keyword. Uh, so Nextcloud knows that the admin group is supposed to exist and it's set to allow anyone in that group to be a server-wide admin. So in the past, you know, however many episodes where we've been talking, you know, when we said administrators can do this, administrators can do that, it's anyone who gets put into that group can do that. Uh, and once that happens, they are immediately able to do whatever a, another admin can do. Um, and that's that's a server-wide admin. Then we also have a users group. This group isn't something that's necessarily recognized by Nextcloud uh, as like a, a hard-coded default or a hard-coded, uh, what do you call that? Not a magic number, but a magic string, I guess, a magic name. So this this users group is, is none of those. It's just a, a group. group that we've... Yeah determined that that uh, our users are gonna go in um, and additionally any admin can create any kind of group they want for instance on my family's install of nextcloud I have a group that's called family sure pretty simple yeah uh, I currently there's no one else that's on that instance that's not part of the family group because we're all family there so when something gets shared and this is kind of the benefit of being in a group when something gets shared with the group, everyone who's a member of that group gets that share. Um, 
there's also all of these integrations that we've been talking about. You know, we've been talking about uh, the the deck application. We've been talking about the um, maybe not necessarily the mail stuff, but like the calendar stuff uh, and the contact stuff. Uh, a lot of those include shares by default or, or some way to share, some way to say, you know, grant a group access and, and edit permissions you know, for stuff like that. Those are all going to be built into to Nextcloud as well as any kind of like third party application that you install on the Nextcloud. Those will have access to those groups that you're creating by default. So those are going to be very powerful when it comes to interactivity inside of your Nextcloud instance. That's mainly what you're going to want to curate to say, let me share it with, you know, if you're thinking organizationally, let me share this with the HR group, or let me share this with the uh, admins group, or let me share this with uh, with the help desk group. Right? You can you can start having these groups, and then for all these different applications, you're going to be presented with the same groups. You're not going to be surprised. You're going to know I'm part of the HR group, so everything the HR groups gets, I get. And then onboarding new users becomes a a, a dream because all you got to do is add them to the HR group. They have all their shares ready to go. They have all their files, all their contacts, everything ready to go. So that's that's the beauty of groups. Not only that, though, groups can also have group administrators. Uh, so from their documentation, the group administrator can, or well, the server administrator can delegate some work by elevating some accounts to group administrator over specified groups. This allows them to create new users as members of these groups, as well as delete or modify them. So they're able to do anything within their specific group. It's it's a nested hierarchy take on per, a permission structure, actually very similar to the thing that Matrix uh, implemented in Spaces, uh, which if we haven't talked about that yet, we should as soon as it comes out of beta. We, we mentioned it last week. I know that for sure. Okay. Um, okay. And we switched over to it as well, but we haven't talked about it. We should talk. We should definitely bring it back up once it's out of beta, though. Because I made the comment last week I that think... it's uh, kind of similar to Linux in that uh, spaces are rooms of rooms or something. Files yeah, yeah, everything's, no, yeah a everything's, file. Everything's, a, everything's a room or something. Yeah. <laughs> everything's a room. Everything's a file. <laughs> yeah. Am I a file? <laughs> <laughs> so that was okay so we did touch on that good but it's a, it's the same kind of permission structure i mean you have these these nested hierarchies where you can have uh, a, a administrator of a specific group rather than the administrator of the entire server you can be a little bit more picky so you got the hr manager at this point being able to delegate stuff to, to hr and manage shares and and permissions and users and so that's it's always a good thing to see, um, being able to have that bit of granularity. So I think there's a lot of, of good things when it comes to the, the group membership and when it comes to the uh, administrator privileges. There's a, there's a really powerful administration system uh, there in place to take advantage of. Now, it's not something you're going to be doing every day. I, I was going to say, I'd call it kind of a set and forget. You know, you, you set them up you're going to want to set them up for your organization no matter what size you are. And then once it is set up, it's kind of like, okay, now we have this person doing this for this role. They're an admin of this group so they can add people to this group. You know, that person steps down or steps away. You can just kind of replace them and they have the role that they have the access they need, but it's definitely something you want to kind of sit down and set up as you're setting up groups within your organization. Cause you probably, I can say this, you don't want everyone having access to everything. You're going to want to break up who has access to finance and all the tax stuff and who has access to, you know, HR files. It's going to be need to be broken up. Yeah, that's that's the uh, uh, application of least privilege, right? You you only want people to have the the permissions that they need to have in order to fulfill their their job. Right. I mean, you don't you don't need to give them the world. You don't have to give them the keys of the kingdom. Right. Just give them enough to get to the financial statements and that they don't have, need to have root on the servers. Right. Go figure. Um, there was there was a, a, a cool instance, though, as, as far as getting into really what administrators can do once they have those kind of uh, architectures set up uh, among groups. 
is that I uh, had my parents over last weekend. I was setting up some new phones for them. We were starting to sync to Nextcloud. Well, I mean, how often do you log into Nextcloud on your phone, right? Almost never. Uh, so re-logging in was a, you know, what might not remember my password kind of instance. So me, who has Bitwarden set up and doesn't have to remember his password uh, and is also a admin on that Nextcloud instance, was able to log in and simply reset the password of a user, right? And that's one of the cool things. And it's like they have documentation on how to do it here, but it was so incredibly simple. You click the button, the little pencil button, the edit button, right? And and you said, I want to change the password and you change the password. I was like, oh. What's that? What's that? Staples, you know, where they hit the easy. That was easy, right? And I was like, "That's that's all I need. I just need something easy." So thank you guys, you know, for that. That was that was that was easy. I was I was happy to have that. Do work. that, yeah. Oh yeah. Really, just happy to have that work. Yeah. There were two other things mentioned in the administrator's documentation that I wanted to touch on. That I thought was interesting. So, the first one is setting storage quotas. So this is something that once you've gotten over the new shininess of logging into your Nextcloud server for the first time and figuring out what all to set up and, and going through the exploration phase where you're looking at all yeah. the new applications, installing a bazillion of them and, and figuring out which ones you like, uh, you, you figure out that, you know, if you start uploading 500 pictures or, you know, 20, 25, 30, 35 videos, your storage starts to get consumed because that's how storage works. So an administrator on a server would want to make sure that you're not eating up too much storage. And that's where setting storage quotas come in, comes into play here. Uh, so in opening their documentation, it's fairly straightforward um, just being able to, to select. Um, I think... You can set a default storage quota. So that's the first one. So that means every new user that comes in gets five gigs or something like that. You're like, all right, you, you can have five gigs. And then you can up that. You can select it for different users, set it to, you know, five gigs, five terabytes, you know, if you have that, if you need that much storage space, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, I know for Compositional Enterprise, we have the ability to add on additional disk, so we can just keep piling that on, and and uh, there's a consolidation method that it goes through, so it's, it's fairly robust. Uh, but still, that's going to be extra expense. So if you're looking to minimize really what you need to, to pay to have this maintained, right? what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to set some kind of storage quotas because turns out storage isn't, isn't free. Uh, there's also a, another way we can do this and we can set it up with an S3 compatible instance, which would also be something uh, DigitalOcean uh, makes available to us. But once again, that's still going to be something that's going to be coming out of someone's pocket. So in setting quotas, at least we can start to manage really everything that's consumed or at very least give us a baseline to say, all right, if we're going above five gigs, what are we doing? And let's start to have that conversation. It's to say, Hey, is there you need anything it? we can be right. doing? Or, right. Or, you know, 20 gigs or 30 gigs or, you know, hundred gigs or 200 gigs. What are we looking at? How are we, are we being good stewards of what we, you know, of, of what we're consuming here? Uh, there was also an, and whatever that was sparked a little, little thought in my head. I was like, "There's, there's a whole another part of this too." And I was, I was right. So Nextcloud does have uh, storage quotas, a, a whole separate documentation on it. Um, and they they talk about how metadata takes up about ten percent of disk space, but is not counted against user quotas. Um, and remember, if if we go back to our conversation about deleted files, right? Deleted files that are still in the trash bin. Are, don't count against quotas, right. but they're still part of the user's they're there. files because they're there. they uploaded them and have since deleted them. Um, and the trash bin itself at this point is set to 50% of, of uh, the quota. So the deleted file agent is set at 30 days. And then when the deleted files exceed 50% of the quota, uh, then the oldest files are removed first until that quota or that, that space uh, gets below that 50%. Um, 
Of course, you can also change that so the trash bin retention is is different than that. Oh yeah, the 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 other thing about uh, shared files. So shared files don't actually count against your quota if you're being shared with, right? But if you share files out, those files do count against your your quota. You own the file. You would own the file at the end of the day. Is how I would kind of look at it. Your it's yours and you're sharing it. I mean, it would make sense to count against your own quota versus, okay, this guy shared it with me. Why you know. I'd be kind of upset if why is this ding against me for my quota? He's the one who shared it. Now, if I had a copy of it, I would call that mine. That's going to count against my quota. Exactly. Now, they can also unshare files with you too. So depends on how confident you are about that. Now, that is also something too that administrators need to be aware of. Um, when you disable users, right? So sometimes you want to disable a user without permanently deleting their settings and files. So this would be something like you need to temporarily shut down an account or just kind of suspend something uh, in order to bring it back at a later date. Uh, the user can be activated at any time again without any data loss, right? Uh, but the user will no longer be able to access their next cloud until you enable them again. And then keep in mind that the files which are shared by this user will no longer be accessible, right? So even though the files are still there on disk, right? the mental gymnastics being, well, the files are still there. Why can't I access them? Well, it's because the permissions are coming from the user, right? So the user would be uh, having those and you cannot read those permissions because the user is disabled. Right. So at this point, th and, and I believe in the documentation, there was like a, uh, I can't remember if there was a workaround or, or if there was, um, you okay yeah so you can create persistent file shares that survive that as well as deleting users which you can also do and there's a whole bl blurb around here and you know i, I felt that was kind of like yeah you can delete users of course right i thought disabling users was a little bit more interesting because it's it's just a suspending their account rather than an entire getting rid of everything you don't have to wipe it off and say oh you know, they left for a while and now they're back. I have to recreate it. It's, oh, hey, you're back. Let me re-enable it for you. Exactly. So, so that there, uh, there's always going to be a workaround. I mean, when, when's there's not, when is there not going to be a workaround? But, um, the default behavior is to cut off those, those file shares as soon as the user is disabled. So the, the functionality is there. Um, to disable the user, I just I found that interesting. Not something that would immediately pop to mind when I go to. All right, well, I need them to not log in right now. That's a good way to do that. Um, I, I think of stuff where you have a heavily rotating cast of characters, something like the Open Source Club, right? right. So you have, um, you know, people coming in and out of college, you know, all, all the time, right? You want to respect people and say, all right, well, you know, we're still gonna have your stuff, but we also don't want you jamming up our bandwidth you know and using this for your personal stuff and we want to make it available if you contact us and say hey by the way there was something that i could retrieve that would be awesome and you'd be like yeah no problem i'd be happy to make that available to you right and and the way to do that is to disable the account and re-enable it upon request right that in enforces the the you're not hogging up our bandwidth while you're not really an active member right. of of this this club or or in the university whatever while still respecting their their files and and what they've uh done there so that was that was interesting to me the the whole concept of of disabling that so i have two applications going here after that but i wanted to stop there and and see if you had any questions or comments concerns emotional outbursts i think i gave you the uh Emotional outbursts. Uh, I, I comment. I, I jumped in when I needed to or when I wanted to. Sure. No, no questions really. Uh, I, I did find it actually pretty cool. I didn't realize. So I knew there was admin. I didn't know there was group admin to actually have like an administer of a group. I didn't know that was a thing. So I'm glad you brought that up or you mentioned that because I thought it was just, you know, here are your admins for the server. Here are your group. Here's your, you know, users. Here's your whatever other group is created. Now, I had no idea that you could create an admin for the group to actually kind of break that down another step. So just kind of one little thing I had to add there. But everything else, 
has been uh i've mentioned or kind of stopped you cool sounds good well like i said there are two applications here that are not installed by default uh, that i think are fairly handy um and i'm gonna do these out of order because that's just the way i roll so the first one i want to talk about is impersonate so by installing the impersonate application on your nextcloud instance uh, you can enable administrators to impersonate other users on the Nextcloud server. This is especially useful for debugging issues reported by users. So this is a really cool application. I, I really do appreciate this. This allows me as an admin to go ahead and, and check stuff for other users. Actually, more importantly, when I'm doing a demo, when I'm spinning up a demo instance of Nextcloud, right, and I create a user, um, all I got to do is log on, then I can switch to that user um, from my, my one login. And then I can just hop user to user, so I don't have to have like three different browser and private windows and sandbox stuff open, where I can just log in and impersonate a user, especially if I want to demonstrate like how stuff gets shared, right? Log in to Nextcloud, share it from the one user, impersonate the second user, and I can demonstrate how it's right there. That makes it super handy. Um, so in order to impersonate a user, an administrator has to simply following the f has to simply follow the following four steps. Log in as administrator to Nextcloud. Open the user administration interface. Select the impersonate button on the affected user and confirm the impersonation. And then at that point you're gonna be impersonate you're gonna be trawling their files, their stuff and, and and going around all that um so the administrator at that point is is then logged in as a user um and then they can switch back to their regular user account um, by logging out so there there are a couple notes here uh right so the first one is this app is not compatible with instances that have encryption enabled so we talked about that and the encryption and the reason this is is that the encryption uses the password for the user to generate the key that unlocks their files. So if their encryption is enabled, I can't impersonate and see the files because I can't put in that password when I impersonate. I'm simply switching the permission structure of, of mine from mine to the users. Right, so that permission is not going to include the password, which therefore cannot generate the decryption key. Therefore, I cannot see any of the encrypted files. Uh, next, while impersonate actions are logged, note that the actions performed impersonated will be logged as the impersonated user. So the audit trail will show the step to impersonate a user, right? But then everything after that, it's not going to say, Andrew as demo user, it'll just say that the demo user did this, right? So it makes auditing, following the audit trail a little bit more difficult, uh, but at least those impersonated actions should be showing up out. Right. Yeah. And, and it should be able to, you, you should be able to track that. It just doesn't make it explicit. And then the last thing here, and, and why I touched on this before, is that impersonating a user is only possible after their first login. So I did want to expressly call that out to say, hey, you can't create a guest user when you and then immediately impersonate that guest user. You have to log in with that guest user is what you're saying. Yes. So the, the password has to be, yeah. Yeah. You have to log in the first time because you, the, you have to go through the whole initial login screen. I'm, I'm not even aware what scripts run uh, on, on first run, but I know almost everything. Whenever I set up anything, anywhere, there's always a first run script because stuff needs to be in, instantiated. Sure. And I can't imagine that Nextcloud is any different. So when they do that, they want the actual user uh, logged in first to, to walk them through all that stuff. And maybe it's something first time to set up the password or whatever. I'm not, I'm not sure. So I would want to to dig a little bit more deeper into that. Uh, but at this point, I'm I'm content with just saying, all right, yeah, sure, you gotta log in with the user first. That's I can open a private window and do that easy. Yeah, so that that app has been really helpful uh, for me, especially trying to get to know how stuff looks from other people's points of view. Right, As when I go to share a file, like one of the things I found out 
when I go to share a file, uh, it doesn't matter where it's in my heart hierarchy, right? It gets put in their root directory structure, right? Um, and then, you know, if I were to be the second user, what happens if I move it, right? And um, how can I test the edit permissions, right? And, and figure out what permissions I need. This is really, really good in order to kind of get a feel for how the interactivity between users is going to, to work, right? Without really spending a whole lot of time and energy kind of flipping back and forth between windows and stuff. Uh, it's just a really quick way to navigate around and, and troubleshoot issues and, and test out new functionality. So um, that is definitely one that I've used before. Uh, I don't have that, I don't think, currently on any of the instances that I manage. Maybe my family one, uh, but it's it's a good one to have, uh, especially if you're uh, you're getting ready to implement a new Nextcloud instance. And and really, if you're new to the software and are, it, you're going to go present it to a team or something like that, um, if you're doing any kind of demonstration or any kind of walkthrough, this is also going to be very, very helpful because you can start impersonating users and saying, hey, all right, let's take a look at your directory structure. Since we use ServiceNow at work, that's that's been a really good way to, to do that as well. I mean, the administrators there are, are top-notch that we have. And they use that all the time in order to kind of demonstrate how to walk through stuff. And when I say, hey, I can't access something, they'll be like, oh, really? Let me let me impersonate you and <laughs> try it out. And they're like, yeah, sure enough, you don't have access to it. I'm like, mm-hmm, that's what I said. And similarly, the other application I have here is the guests application. This one's pretty cool. This one I haven't necessarily been able to, to play around with, uh, but this pitches it like so. It says uh, this, this application allows for better collaboration with external users by allowing users to create guest accounts. So guest accounts can be created from the share menu by entering either the recipient's email or name and choosing create guest account. Once the account, or excuse me, once the share is created, the guest user will receive an email notification about the mail with a link sent to their password. It's pretty cool. Um, guest users can only access files shared to them and can't create any files outside of shares. Additionally, the apps accessible to guest accounts are whitelisted. Right? So you would, one, have to explicitly say you are able to access both the files and the calendar account, or you can just say, nah, all you get is the files, right? And not only that, all you get are the shares within the share that I shared with you right. in the files. So this is, this is like a hyper sandboxed account uh, where really they are only getting the bare minimum and it's really only meant for collaboration purposes with right. external yeah. users. Um, now, this may require an SMTP setup, uh, which is something that we may be implementing Q3 or Q4. I don't know if it's going to be Q3, but it, it's certainly something I want to tackle this year. Uh, so adding SMTP would be integral to this because this then allows them to set set their password. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it, it, it may be something that can work without that. I'm not sure. But... Um, because, I mean, you can send email from anywhere that has port 25 open, right? It's just, it's not going to come through an SMTP server that has, you know, reverse DNS and DKIM and DeepMark set up. So Gmail's probably going to label it as spam. So you might want to not do that and instead figure out a, a, a better way to, to have them set their password. Um, but... At some point, right, and and if email is set up, right, because I can set this up from within Nextcloud, I can say, hey, by the way, you know what, I'm just going to set this up with my personal email, right, right, and then I can just use that, right. We're, what we're talking about is like a compositional enterprise specific, right. Our infrastructure will be able to to handle that, yeah, um, and and that'll automatically propagate through the instances, yada yada yada. You know, even if we don't have that set up, that mean that doesn't mean that that's not something that you can do right now today, right? You can go ahead and and say, hey, I want to relay this through Yahoo or through Fastmail or Proton, Protonmail, yeah, and anything like that. Um, so, 
there is certainly ways to get this up and running immediately uh, is is what I'm trying to say. But I thought that was a really cool app. Um, and I think that really helps with external communication, even even in instances like, hey, I want and, and, and I have yet to test this, but like sharing calendars. Right. I think that would be awesome because I don't want everyone to see all my calendars, but I still, you know, want them to have an account to be able to create events for me. Right. Uh, especially if we have a shared calendar and it's like, hey, by the way, can you add this to our calendar? And, you know, they're like, yeah, absolutely. And they, they add it to the calendar. They don't, you know, have any other calendars or any other whatever, but they can absolutely access that one. Uh, same thing with with files. If you're doing anything collaboratively, if you're doing any video editing or just document sharing, you know what what have you, right? And you want more than a public share. You want them to be able to upload, download, but you know, and because you can already upload, download, and you can also password protect stuff. So at this point, that would just be another level of getting them into the ecosystem. And honestly, it's not a bad way to onboard someone and say, you know what, look. Don't worry about 90% of what Nextcloud is, right? All I want you to do is right here, you know, calendar thing right here. People understand what a calendar is or files. People understand what a file is. Easier to work work your way into that ecosystem and say, oh, yeah, by the way, what you're working with is Nextcloud. You don't have to worry about it. It does its job. And and really, at the end of the day, that's all you need. I mean, you, you just need some that that does your job for you. And yeah, we expose all the administrative stuff. You know, we're, we're not a, a shared hosting provider for that, for that exact reason, right? We want to make sure that you can have the ability to act as a power user, right? You can have the ability to mess up sometimes, right? But giving you that, that safety net, Right. In in order to to catch you if if you do end up falling. But with that level of that level of access, you can really start tweaking and really start making stuff work for you. Right. So if if you're looking at if, if you're using some of these managed services. Right. And I know uh, Google Google Docs. Right. And and Google Photos and all that, they're, they're starting to, to clamp stuff down, right? They're not letting you do stuff. If you're sick and tired of that, right, and what you're hearing is is vibing with you, um, definitely at least sign up for the mailing list at rcompose.com, right? That's where you're going to be getting all the news and updates. That's where you're going to be getting the, you know, the, the stuff we're putting out, the, the how-tos, right, these, these episode reminders, stuff like that. We will keep producing this stuff as long as we can for you, right? This is this is what we love to do, and and to be fair, we're pretty good at it. Absolutely, I would say. And I think it's I think it's the only ethical thing to do. So we're we're gonna keep providing the service and uh, and 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 keep preaching this message as, as long as we can. And speaking of pre- preaching messages, right? We've actually got the last in a long series the longest i think we've had so far yeah for at least for your grab bag on how to win friends and influence people now i still automatically laugh when i hear that because i think it was last episode or the first one or two episodes ago you said uh actually it's a book not on how to win friends and influence people it's how to maintain relationships and <laughs> go about keeping your relationships or something like that yeah yeah it's so true. How to establish and maintain relationships. Yeah. I absolutely love that. I keep going back to it. Um, but this week is the last part of how to win friends and influence people. And it's called, it's uh, be a leader, how to change people without giving offense or arousing resentment. And I thought it did have a lot, a lot in common with uh, last episode and the second last episode, but it kind of drives home a lot of the point, a lot of the, I almost want to call them, they're, they're different points, but it's more about influence on this one than it is about basically how not to upset people. And so there are nine principles. I'll, I'm just going to dive right into them. Uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, the first one here is if you must find fault, 
This is the way to begin. It's always easier to listen to unpleasant things after we've heard some praise or of our good points. I mean, I think we talked about this two weeks ago or two episodes ago, I should say, uh, with no one like everyone puts up the wall immediately when they hear you're not doing a good job or you're doing this poorly. It's always good to start with the praise first and then add in the and you could doing be doing this better. And also note, don't add the but because if you tell them a good thing and you say but after it, people it he said this in the book, people just tune out. They don't want to hear anything after that. So instead of using that but as a contraction, use the and as a contraction. And if next time you could do it this way, and if you could do it that way. That is that is one of the stupidest things that has had one of the biggest impacts. Absolutely, because people tune out after they hear but and I I don't know why. It, it, I can say it from personal experience. It's like, you know, people say you're doing such a great job, but can you, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, if they say and, I, I'm still, they still have me tuned in. They still have me tuned in. So it's a weird one. It, it's definitely, though, they had an example here that I really like. I'm, they had a few examples that I really liked this uh this section um i only had a few of them but the ones i had i I thought were really good well i was gonna say so yeah the the principle for this chapter uh begin with praise and honest appreciation is is where you're going yeah oh i was gonna go into the example for this one which was the bronze sub subcontractor so they were building i think they were building a building i think with bronze i maybe they weren't who knows they were building something maybe it was a ship for all i know I, i don't know what you build with bronze they were building something with bronze and they couldn't, you know, they were doing the construction. They weren't doing the bronze creation. You know, they weren't making the bronze for this. They weren't doing end to end. They basically had a bronze contract subcontractor that they hired out. And the, you know, it was a pretty extensive bidding war for who could get the job. And then sure enough, this one guy got the job and he said, he can't make the timing. He said, look, I can't make it at this time. So the person that, was hiring the subcontractor flew out or drove out or trend, you know, got there to, to the contractor and said, Hey, look, we think you do a great job. And we just basically delivered praise on this guy, similar to how Dale did it to the dog breeder. And the bronze contract subcontractor was basically like, Hey, look, I don't, I, I can't create, you know, I'm not going to be able to do this in this amount of time. And he says, look, you're such a great subcontractor. I don't know if they had a past relationship or what, but he went on to keep continue to compliment this guy. And sure enough, instead of pulling, you know, eight hour days, just when he could work, you know, doing a regular shift, he was, I think it had something he he was working almost around the clock on getting this bronze out. And sure enough, he made the shipment on time basically just because he received some praise from, the guy he was hired saying, Hey, look, we hired you for a reason. You know, we hired you for a reason. So I've got a thought on that. I don't have the book in front of me here, but I think one of the things he also did, you know, working around the clock, sure. But he, he also realigned his priorities. Right. And I think you'll find that more often than not, I don't have time to do this is code for, I'm not prioritizing. Exactly. I'm not making time, right? Because no one has time. If I could hold time and squish it a little bit, like that would be amazing. I I can't, right? I have to, I have to set aside time. I have to make time. I have to, you know, make sure that I, that I determine that that time is going to be used for a specific purpose. And that's at the detriment of whatever else that I could be doing. So that is 100% 100% right. prioritization. And who are you going to prioritize? You're going to pri- prioritize the people that are going to make you feel good after you do the thing, right? So you, that's why you cultivate that kind of environment where, you know, you you know you're expecting and you know that you're going to get that reward, right, after you get it. You know, you're going to deal with the person who's most agreeable because you don't want to prioritize someone who's not agreeable, right? And you're not going to find – you're not going to prioritize someone who keeps, you know, complaining to right. you, right? Um and, and my favorite phrase, and it's been rattling around my head since I talked on it, but, you know, don't criticize, condemn, or complain, right? And that's, that is 100% words to live by, right? So he's saying here, right, if you must find fault, this is the way to begin, right? But he's, he's almost saying at the end of it, don't even find fault, 
right? Just bring up the problem, right? Make sure the problem is, is, you know, Hey, this is a problem. I don't, I'm not, I'm not blaming, blaming someone is almost worse in my eyes than, than coming up with excuses to do stuff. And I hate when I hear excuses, right? I hate when I say, Hey, by the way, this thing, uh, so let's take a look at this thing. And I immediately say, Oh, here's an excuse why I didn't get that thing done. I'm like, that's the first thing that comes to your mind is you want to give me an excuse. Like that's, I, I don't even like that more than that. So being able to, to bring it up and saying, Hey, you know what? I, I don't want to criticize. I don't want to condemn. I don't want to complain. I want to state the problem. And then we can talk about the problem, right? Obviously it's a, it's a problem. So it's, it's no use hiding it. Right. And I don't want to hear an excuse against it, but let's, move forward and solve the problem. It's the way to start. This is about the way to start it. But jumping into the next one here, it's how to criticize and not be hated for it. And this is the perfect example. I loved it. It's uh, Charles Schwab was walking a factory and two gentlemen were smoking under a no smoking sign. Okay, that is too, per- like, really? Were they actually? Come on. He handed them cigars and asked them to smoke them outside. They had known at this point they had broken the rules. I mean, fake or not i guess it's just e- it's easy it's uh, you know it's very easy to just sit there and be like well no one's gonna bust us it's not like we're standing near hazardous material you know we're not standing next to open gasoline containers probably want us to smoke outside so it's not fumey in here or whatever sure enough yeah. you know he didn't ask them to leave he called it out indirectly which is principle two right there call attention to people's mistakes indirectly he said he handed them cigars and said, hey, just smoke these out. Go smoke these outside. He's not saying what you're doing right now. He's like, here's this. Could you could you grab these outside? Yeah. Hey, got these for you. If you don't mind not smoking under the no smoking sign. But they were able to save face. You know, let the other person save face. Let's see here. That's like four or five. Yeah, that's you're a little bit of ahead of uh, a little bit ahead here. Yeah. Number five. Let the other person save face. Yeah. I like that one. I did really like that one. Calling it indirectly. It was a perfect example. I mean, like, like first of all, who carries around cigars in their pockets nowadays? Anyways, sure. right? First, first of all, but also that's just a brilliant way of finding the most opaque way through to a successful solution. Right. Like that's not. The, I could have. I could have gone through that scenario, you know, twenty different times in my head, and I would never have come up with that idea. It's like these things, hey, I'm, I would love to get, yeah, I want to give you guys these, right? Um, let's, you know, go, when you smoke these, smoke these outside. Yeah. I'm not going to say anything about what you're doing right now, but when you smoke these, smoke them out there. Too perfect of an example. It was the one that stuck out to me. I really liked it because he's doing it indirectly. He didn't say to that. He didn't say anything to, he, you know, he said, he did say something to him. He said, smoke these outside, you know, smoke them outside, but too perfect of an example almost so the next one here is talking about your own mistakes first the one thing i took away from the chapter was admitting your own mistakes can help convince somebody to change their behavior so rather than calling them out on their faults basically saying hey look you know these are the things i'm struggling with right now or whatever and then they can kind of sympathize with you and you can sympathize with them and then you can kind of direct it towards hey look we both have this kind of stuff going on. We both, nobody has time. It's kind of goes back to that. You can't ball up time and squish it. Where are your prior, where are your priorities right now? And why are they, why are they that? But calling to let you basically, if you call out your own, you can then kind of start to call out them. Cause you kind of have an, one of the, I would say an e- even or le- more level playing field of, Hey, everything's on the table right now. This is where everyone you know this is where we're both kind of at which i really liked and it, it's addressing your own first before calling them out on theirs that i think kind of op- i would say it opens them up and then leads to them kind of them kind of opening up and then you can kind of kind of i don't want to say jump jump on not jump on them but like you can address what you need to address basically there's there's something tangential to that i'm not remembering where i got it from but there was a there was a book i read once that was talking about ways to almost like reverse psychology someone and they said 
if you get super upset about something, that allows the other person to take the stance of the rational person. Right. Right. Um, so, like, if they come at you upset, you can, you know, one of the, one of the smartest things is either to, like, match that level of intensity or go above and beyond and force them into, well, I, I'm not that upset. Right. So, let me take the, the opposite. <laughs> let, me, let me try to calm them down. Right. right? Uh, and then you can say, you know, I, I'm so bad at this. This is literally the worst thing ever. So, they are free to take the stance of, well... You know what? It's it's not that bad, and I've also made this mistake too. And actually, I wanted you know, it's something I should probably talk to you about it, right? Which is another great way to indirectly bring attention to right. something is to say, hey, you know what? I'm I and I think this was spelling mistakes. You know, he's like, you know what? I've I've messed up so many different spelling mistakes before, and you know, I've I've done so much, and and you know, someone is then free to say. You know what? I do too, and I think I made some in the last note too. And You're jumping right ahead so, here. I think that's the ninth principle, I want to say, or seventh. Yeah, yeah, that is. Cool. I think it's seven. I think we mentioned it here. Principle three: talk about your own mistakes before criticizing the other person. Moving right along, no one likes to take orders. This one I thought was Ooh. pretty self-explanatory. I didn't really have there. I didn't see a good anecdote for this chapter. A good example from this chapter. Um, the principle makes sense and it lines up. The principle is ask questions instead of giving orders. I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that or any kind of personal anecdotes. I, it makes sense to me. I, I really like it. It's, it is very easy. It, it kind of goes back to the, uh, what'd you say? The four types of leaders, man, I'm jumping back here. Now you'll have to correct me on this. I think it's, you know, if you're in a time of crisis, you're going to want, you're going to need someone calling the shots and directing orders. Now, in times where it's not like that, it's probably best to go about having goals, moving towards those goals, but not saying directly to whoever, whatever, do this, do this, do this, do this, just ask the questions. And I think it's more of a lead them, lead them to get to the right answer by asking the questions about how you, you know, how you're getting there, but let them take that with them, if that makes sense. Let them take that and go with it on their own. The safety valve in handling complaints, right? It was let the other people talk themselves out. They know more, more about their business and problems than you do. You get men must be taught as if you taught them not and things unknown proposed as things forgot, right? Which I, I always thought was a fun little couplet there. But that being, you know, the easiest way to... Oh, yeah, here, principle seven. Let the other person feel that the idea is his or hers. Exactly that, yeah. And I, I think it falls under that same kind of vein. It's ask questions, leading them, you know, kind of planting the seed in their head and then kind of asking them, is the seed growing, basically? Just kind of taking that analogy and kind of running with it. And you can't be snarky about it either. You have to be genuine about it i think that's a lot of what the book is though that's the first couple the first set of the first two kind of sets of chapters is being genuine when you start to address these things absolutely yeah because if you're if you're genuine about it i mean you can start to say stuff like you can start leading them on a socratic discussion and and you you can start saying hey where do where do we find common ground right right i mean where where do we both stand? And then where do we go from there? You know, do you believe this as well? Great. Do you believe this as well? Great. And you can you can work your way up there. Um, and, and not even necessarily say, well, don't you think this would be a better solution? Or did you not think about this option? That's not the kind of questions we're talking about. <laughs> you know, it, it, instead, of, instead of giving orders, you can ask questions, right? But the questions what better be... Genuine. You know, they better be genuine. Are these, you know... Did you think of everything? Are these in your priority? Right. You know, what, one of the great questions I like, and usually I don't phrase it this way, but you know, how is your autonomy mastery and yeah. purpose? You know, how, how, how are those three things going? You know, and being the core tenets of motivation, right? If someone's not doing something. It's probably going to be one of those three. So either pick one and ask kind of leading questions there and say, Hey, well, what's going on here? Um, is there, is there something you're, you know, not able to do, right? I mean, are you are you getting hung up on something? I think I think, you know, on Sunday or Monday our meeting, right? I I, I was asking you if you're getting hung up on something. Yeah. Right? Cuz I was just 
It's it's just right. an easy question to ask. It's like, well, even if you haven't admitted it to yourself, right? Hearing that question come from outside can address it, right? Yeah, and and that's that's one of the hardest things for me is is really, what are the right right questions to ask, right? And and maybe that's something we can dive into sooner or later. But you know, a lot of these principles are you know when you know, are answered by asking questions or be nice, you know, and we got a little bit of the practical things about how to, you know, people like to hear the sound of their own name. Like that's a very a practical good one, way to right, be practical. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that's really easy to implement Jack. And I can just keep, right. <laughs> keep on talking, talking that way. And then, you know, Jack, if you had any other, you know, it's, it's like that, but, but yeah, I mean, you can, you can, know to ask the questions but not know what questions to ask especially in situations where you where you're trying to motivate someone right and and maybe they're in a really fragile place and and you have to be careful right what what questions do you ask what is the right thing to say and and that's that's a lot more difficult than just knowing what approach to take you know now i know what approach to take it how do i take it that's outside of the scope of this book i don't know save for another grab bag maybe I've got I've got a couple books. I mean, I we we might just turn this into book club here because I got a a couple <laughs> good ones uh, in the pipe over here. You can see in my in my new bookshelf um, yeah. back yeah, yeah, here, yeah, yeah. watching the video feed. I got the uh, I got all of the the shelves filled up uh, except for the top two, top four actually. One of the top ones. That's my to do list and you will see this continually grow larger yeah. and larger as i as i keep getting more books but um hopefully i'm able to knock off a couple here and there definitely oh i'm gonna keep going here i think you already took you already yeah. mentioned this one uh let the other person save face you already meant you mentioned it i think on the first one here so firing employees is not much fun getting fired is even less fun was the quote i took away from this one the example i loved it uh, it was a GE example um, of some guy. I'm just going to call him Charlie. His name is Charles Steinmetz. Sorry, Steinmetz. <laughs> Charlie. Uh, worked at GE. Brilliant engineer. Uh, but he was, I guess they made him in charge of some finance department or some account. It said the accounting department, and they made him in charge of that. So I guess he had people under him. He wasn't good at managing money or people. So they ended up reassigning him with a new title where he was happy and the officers of GE were happy as well. Basically he got to work with a new title for the work he was already doing as an engineer. And the officers got to replace him with someone else to lead the depart to lead that other department. You know, even if the, it, it kind of jumps in here. Even if we are right and the other person is definitely wrong, we only destroy ego by causing someone else to lose face. So, yeah, and that's a really good example of you know that that same kind of give them a cigarettes and indirect or cigars and indirectly call attention to you know right um, give them give them something to be excited about and that's part of the indirect part of it. Hey, I get a new a new cool title, but I'm actually doing work I was already doing before. I'm indirectly getting a demotion to do something I am better at. Yeah, you already called it out, but principle five: let the other person save face. The next one here is how to per how to spur people on to success. Uh, the good things people do will be reinforced and the poorer things will atrophy for lack of attention. I, I mean, that's like any, it, I kind of look at that the same as I look at any skill, you know, if you don't practice it, you're not going to, you're not going to get better at it. It's kind of going to atrophy, you know, it's going to atrophy. You're not, you're not, it's going to kind of swindle down, you know, you're, if you're not used to doing it or you're not doing it a lot, you know, you're just going to get not worse at it, but, it's kind of like you get rusty basically. And the perfect example I look at is kind of programming. Um, if you're not doing it all the time or not doing it a lot, you just kind of, your skills don't dwindle per se, but you aren't as sharp. You basically are not as sharp. Um, so kind of jumping in here, we all crave appreciation and recognition and we will do almost anything to get it, but nobody wants insincerity. Nobody wants flattery. Again, I think, principle of the book be genuine be genuine when you ask questions be genuine when you talk to people and compliment them uh jumps into a quote let me repeat the principles taught in this book will only work when they come from the heart 
<laughs> I'm not advocating a bag of tricks. I'm talking about a new way of life. And that's from Dale himself. So not much else to add. Uh, principle six here is praise the slightest improvement and praise every improvement. Quote, be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise. So that's another good phrase to, to remember. Be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise. Yeah. Be genuine. Jump in the next one here. It's a uh, give a dog a good name. The average person the average person can be led readily if you have his or her respect and you show that person you respect that person for some kind of ability. Now, this one I, I, it kind of felt like a jump, um, but I guess if they have that ability with if that person you're kind of complimenting and pushing forward has the ability within them, you can lead them. So, in short, if you want to improve a person in a certain aspect, act as though that particular trait were already one of his or her outstanding characteristics, Characteristics, which I think you have to find, put, find the inner motivation for them before you push them to do that thing. You have to find what drives them first before you say, hey, I want you to do this. Because if they're not driven to do that thing, you're not going to push them to get there, basically. So... I think with this one, it's you have to give them a fine reputation to live up to, and they will make the prodigious efforts uh, rather than see you dis disillusioned. Um, so principle seven is give the other person a, f a reputation to live up to. Uh, actually, I think that one kind of coincides with nine, um, which is making people glad to do what you want. But I'm going to jump here to eight, which is make the fault seem easy to correct. Easy to correct. Basically this is the example that jumps into it. So basically there's this really bad kid that all, I think it was second and third grade teachers both complained about. They both just complained about this kid. He was really smart, but he picked fights. It was almost like he was ahead. Um, the fourth grade teacher pointed, she actually pointed at every student in the class and said, Oh, Susie, I really like your hair or, you know, Bob, you're really fast or whatever. Uh, this kid basically got up and she said to him, I need you to be a leader in this class and I need you to step up. So she reinforced it on him three to four times in the first few weeks. And after that, he was basically better in the classroom. He didn't have disciplinary problems. He wasn't picking fights with people. He was a leader in the classroom. So she essentially enabled him to do better things and act more responsibly, but kind of giving him this reputation to live up to. Uh, she also did this by using encouragement and making the fault seem easy to correct which now that i read the principle i think it was this anecdote was supposed to be back a chapter <laughs> but um it's kind of boils down to the same kind of leading the person giving them expectations to live up to and then kind of having them live up to them yes that makes more sense for the previous chapter yeah the last one here is making people glad to do what you want to do. And another great example here, it was uh, an example of Woodrow Wilson picking his friend over someone more qualified to go overseas in an attempt to bring peace to Europe. Uh, so the guy's name was Brian. He said, Brian was disappointed when he heard he wasn't going, but he was told, quote, the president thought it would be unwise for anyone to do this officially and that his going would attract a great deal of attention and people would wonder why he was there. Basically they told this guy he's too important to let go out of the country. So by telling him this, he was actually, you're basically praising the guy at this point saying, Hey, we need you in the country to do more important things. You know, no one has done this in Europe before, you know, good luck basically if you're going to Europe. So they kept him in the U S and sure enough, he felt good for it. He felt great for it. Uh, the other example here is uh, the pear tree. Basically, there was a pear tree in this uh, family's yard, and the dad said to one of the kids, hey, you have to pick up all these pears. And, of course, the kid's just going to go, well, what's the benefit? You know, what's the benefit for, benefit for me? I don't want to do this. So the dad said to the guy, basically, hey, or the dad said to the kid, hey, I'll pay you for every a dollar for every full basket of pears, but I'll take away a dollar for every every pear you leave on the ground. So sure enough, you know, the kid is driven by this money in a sense. So he picks up all these pairs and he's not going to leave one on the ground. 
So at the end of the day, the kid's going to be happy about doing this because he's able to pick up all these pairs, make all this money, and then, you know, he doesn't have to worry about, you know, not basically he's intrinsically he's motivated by money at this point he doesn't have to worry it's not a job for it's a job for him anymore but he's driven driven by it uh so principle nine is make the other person happy about doing the thing you suggest and i guess the pair example is kind of a dumb one but the kid was driven by money (laughs) um the woodrow wilson one i did really like though which was uh he's woodrow wilson ended up picking a friend instead of sending over you know this well-known advisor and then basically telling the advisor hey this job's too important for you and in when in fact they really just want Woodrow Wilson wanted to just send his friend over yeah it's like you're you're too ho- high profile for this and he's like oh I am really <laughs> really that kind of wraps up the book the the three I really liked were the uh first one which was uh begin with praise and honest appreciation kind of principle of the book you know be genuine the uh how to criticize which how can you forget that example of charles schwab handing people cigars and telling them hey look you're not supposed to smoke he didn't even say you're not supposed to smoke right here hey why don't you smoke these outside handing of cigars um and then i did really like you know obviously letting the other person save face yeah i mean and and that this this all kind of revolves around that try if at all possible do not criticize condemn or complain Right. And you can see in all of these examples, really good ways of getting around that, like that that Woodrow Wilson one that you were talking about. Right? He didn't he didn't criticize and say, "Hey, you're you're probably not the right person for this because of this, this, and this." Right? He he simply said, "You know what? You're you're too high profile for this." Right? And and let's let's use you, you know, in in the position that that you're meant to fulfill and where your strengths lie and stuff like that, where, where, where people would be most affected by you. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, being while, while still being genuine about right. it, right. He wasn't trying to be underhanded. He was just trying to say, look, instead of focusing on the negative aspects of this, I'm going to focus on the positive as- aspects of this. Right. Um, instead of criticizing, condemning or complaining, right. I'm going to give you a good name, right. I'm going to give you cigars. Right. I'm going to, you know, yeah, I'm going to make you feel good, make you make you want to do the thing. And I mean, I think it was the first first episode. I mean, you're not going to get anything done unless someone wants to do right. it. Right. Yeah. Even even if you win the argument, it's still going to be, you know, a man convinced against his will of is of the same opinion still. You know, you you really have to to convince them, right, to want to do the thing uh, in, in order for them to do it. So, uh, and, and and stuff like onboarding someone into a new system or, or a new workflow is, is hard, right? I know this because I, I do this all the time, right? Um, learning how to use Nextcloud, using um, Camboard or, 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 or Firefly or, or anything like that is, is difficult, right? I... I try my hardest to come in here and and go through these things and and sure especially in the podcast this isn't you know personalized or anything uh but when we're coming in here right we're bound right just from what we've gone over from the from the stuff we're talking about we are focusing on on the positive aspects of this right we're we're not we're not coming in and criticizing or, or condemning what's been what's been done before right we're coming in and, and and trying to help you right and you know if if this is something that that you need help with or or if you know someone like this right uh the easiest way to to keep kind of getting these updates and and to understand how we're going through this is to to sign up for the newsletter at arcompose.com that is probably the easiest thing to forward over to someone and say, hey, by the way, check this out. Check yeah. this out. I heard about it. Sounds like you were having a problem with, you know, organization or, you know, getting getting stuff together or, you know, managing what, what you have on your plate or, or what have you. It could be backups. You, you could know someone who just lost all their contacts on their phone, right? But it's really hard to come at that because it's easy to condemn or 
or you know criticize you know you should have had this set up you should have had that set up i guarantee they're already thinking that through their heads right the last thing they need is for you to say that if you're able to come to them and and shoot them an email saying hey by the way i'm on this mailing list and, and they sent this out i i know you had a problem with this don't know if this can help out but i'd be happy to you know to 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 shoot this over to you so that's a really easy way to share the show right and an easy way to get this message out right so uh you can you can go to rcompose.com sign up for that mailing list and that's going to be the easiest way to to get that out um as well as just give you reminders right because because we put this stuff and more in there to to make sure that we we're reinforcing this and and we we have all this stuff put together in a way that's actually going to be helpful. And with that, we hope you enjoyed this episode of Arkham Postcast. Thank you. Be safe. And we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.